My name is Janae Nelson, and I am the President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the escalating threat of violence against black institutions and for your example of bipartisan partnership and leadership in introducing HR 6825. The Legal Defense Fund is a black legacy institution. Founded in 1940 under the leadership of Thurgood Marshall, a graduate of two historically black universities, Lincoln University and Howard University School of Law, LDF was launched at a time of widespread state-sponsored violence and inequality. As the organization that litigated Brown versus Board of Education, which ended legal apartheid in the US, LDF has long led the struggle for education equity, and that struggle is ongoing. On January 4th, 2022, at least eight HBCUs received what would be the first of an escalating number of bomb threats in just the first three months of this year. Following this initial rash of bomb threats, the FBI released a statement that they were being, quote, investigated as racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism and hate crimes. As Chairman Thompson met, mentioned, this is a national security threat. The attacks did not stop. During the month of February, Black History Month, there was not a single week in which the safety and security of an HBCU and its predominantly black student populations were not threatened with terrorist violence. An estimated 57 HBCUs and churches have received bomb threats this year alone. To understand why HBCUs are the target of such vitriol, we must understand their history. HBCUs were established in the early 19th century in direct resistance to state-sponsored denial of education for black people. HBCUs were created to be safe havens for a people for whom education was previously illegal or out of reach. They provided and continue to provide to this day the opportunity for predominantly black student populations to receive a quality post-secondary education in a nurturing environment that lays bare the myths of white supremacy and black inferiority. Although HBCUs make up only 3% of the country's colleges and universities, they enroll 10% of all black students and produce almost 20% of all black graduates, including Howard University alumna Kamala Harris, the first black woman vice president of the United States. And there is a long and ignominious history of bomb threats made and realized upon other black institutions in the United States. As Reverend Manning mentioned, in 1963, the KKK infamously bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church, killing four young girls and terrorizing more than 400 congregants. Black churches have remained a target of white extremist hate and violence, as evidenced by the horrific mass killing at Mother Emanuel in 2015. This nation also has a shameful history of using the powers of the state and private acts of violence to prevent black people from receiving an education. HBCUs sit at the intersection of these painful histories of violence against black people, black legacy institutions, black advancement, and black education. And although white extremist activity and violence are not new, there has been a disturbing increase in recruitment, propaganda, and visibility of such groups in recent years. In 2021, the FBI warned this very committee that, quote, the top threat we face from domestic violent extremists stems from those we identify as racially, ethnically motivated violent extremists. Indeed, racism is our greatest threat to national security. The bomb threats made to HBCUs are evidence of increased violence across the country. To reverse this harmful trend, in addition to the ongoing investigation of, yes, by the FBI, this committee must conduct a parallel investigation to ascertain the specific animus of these attacks, to determine how future occurrences can be prevented, and to issue findings and solutions to prevent this ongoing threat. Congress must also ensure that HBCUs and other legacy institutions have the necessary funding to protect themselves from future attacks. To that end, Congress should pass H.R. 6825, the Nonprofit Security Grant Program Improvement Act, which would expand and strengthen the Nonprofit Security Grant Program. 
Despite these threats of terrors, HBCUs have remained resilient in their mission and black religious organizations continue to serve as a central institution in black communities across the nation. But the continuing threat of racialized violence and the targeting of black institutions is a scenario that no student, faculty, or staff member, religious leader, devotee, or institution should have to endure in 2022. We call on Congress to bring the full power and resources of the federal government to protect these hallowed institutions that strengthen and enrich our society and to ensure the safety and security of every resident of this country, regardless of race or ethnicity, especially those who are targets of domestic racial terror. Thank you. HBCUs have been systematically underfunded, not only by state legislatures, but also by the federal government. And many HBCUs are land grant institutions. These are schools that were founded by state legislature, that are funded by state legislatures uh, to foster agricultural research and instruction. And often that funding that they receive from state legislatures is in inadequate. Compared to their white counterparts, black land grant universities have been underfunded by at least $12.8 billion over the last three decades. And funding for land grant institutions is distributed at the discretion of the state legislature. And in many cases, these state legislatures choose to overfund white land grant institutions while barely meeting the required funding for black land grant institutions. And there are specific examples that we cite in our written testimony about the University of Tennessee and the Tennessee General Assembly uh, uh, awarding land grant dollars in a way that is quite disparate, uh, more than four times the required match of funding that the university should have received. So if you think about the underfunding compounded by the fact that there are unexpected costs imposed by these threats of domestic terror, the financial hit to HBCUs is quite significant. And I will add that many HBCUs, because of the underfunding, are more tuition dependent than other institutions. And the threat of violence on these campuses has the potential to reduce enrollment, has the potential to uh, cast a, a, a chilling effect on the, on the desire of students to attend these institutions that are targeted by violence. And that has the potential to impact not only immediate revenue, but also long-term viability. I absolutely think that the expansion of funding for HBCUs for other nonprofit institutions and, and places of worship is essential as a, as a preventive measure for additional violence. The threat against black institutions continues to loom large. It continues to impact the psyches of students and, and parishioners who attend religious institutions. And it also has a significant financial impact. These institutions are now required to provide security in a way that many other institutions don't have to worry about simply because of the racial or religious makeup of their constituencies. This requires not just additional physical infrastructure, but technological support. It also, for HBCUs in particular, may require additional resources around mental health services. Students have been traumatized by these threats of violence that disrupt their learning environment and that subject them to a constant threat of potential violence in a space that is meant to be a safe haven for their education. And so those resources can serve to improve the campus environment and improve the safety and protect those populations both on campuses and at religious institutions across the country. And in what ways would you connect uh, the attacks on black institutions to the larger universe of threats posed by white supremacy and extreme uh, right wing ideology? Well, I connect them directly because right now we are in the midst of an assault on truth. We're in the midst of an attempt to erase the lived experiences 
of black Americans and people of color. And it's not only black people who are under severe attack. As we see, there have been many instances of violence against Asian American and Pacific Islander persons in this country, against people from various religious backgrounds, synagogues, mosques, places of uh, learning and, and worship have been targeted. But we do know that black institutions have endured this unfortunate uh, legacy of violence for their entire existence. And it is now escalating at a time when we should have evolved as a society towards a more peaceful and respectful um, uh, coexistence. And that is the reason that we demand that Congress address this issue before we find ourselves uh, in a more retrogressive state. Black institutions have been threatened since their inception. And if we think about black institutions in a very broad sense, we can go as far back as thinking about the burning of Tulsa. We can think about the burning of Greenwood. We can think about the deconstruction of any signs of black progress, any establishments that reject the notion of white supremacy and black inferiority. Our black churches are an exemplar of black resilience and stand at the center of black communities throughout our nation. Our black HBCUs are also an exemplar of black excellence and the ability of black people to learn together in a safe and nurturing environment, independent and resilient. It is those institutions that are the targets and have been the targets over time of white extremist violence. We are seeing an uptick in hate crimes, an uptick in the creation of white extremist groups. And these institutions are a ready-made target for those individuals and entities. It is essential, therefore, that these entities have the ability to protect themselves and to build the necessary infrastructure to secure the populations that attend these institutions. But it is also not only for those individuals, this is an investment that this country should make because these institutions are essential to its historical identity and to its present diversity. So that is why we are calling upon Congress to invest as many resources as possible to ensure that these institutions are viable, that they are safe, and that they continue to contribute to the fabric of our broader American society. I'd like to address just a few comments to the representative from the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, just for edification purposes, um, many people may not know, and I think it's worthy of mentioning at this hearing, this institution was founded by the Honorable Thurgood Marshall, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. And um, I wanna thank you, Ms. Nelson, for your position with the organization. I was uh, an NAACP branch president for about a decade and have some sense of the difficulties uh, that we encounter when we attempt to uh, use these grant applications. Uh, sometimes they can be very difficult to negotiate. So I thought I'd ask you a couple of questions related to the grant application process well, thank you very much, Representative Green, for acknowledging the Legal Defense Fund and its and its founder, Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I will defer to Mr. Hudson to talk about the grant application process as the Legal Defense Fund is not presently applying for a grant application. But we do note that there are institutions, other institutions, other nonprofits that uh, want to take advantage of this program and we support the increase in funding and the act uh, that that is on the floor today that would increase funding to the NSGP to $500 million for each fiscal year from 2023 to 2028, which we believe is a very necessary intervention as black institutions continue to be subject to hateful attacks across the country. Ms. Nelson, in the wake of the recent HBCU bomb threats, the NAACP called for the full accountability arrest prosecution and conviction for those responsible for these threats. Charles Ardrey University in my district still doesn't know if the perpetrator was caught. Can you talk about the importance of accountability and how Congress can help address the unequal and selective criminal justice enforcement measures you've seen over the years? 
Yes, thank you. I, I want to emphasize how important it is for uh, Congress and for federal law enforcement to aggressively investigate and prosecute hate crimes. They are a scourge on our society. They represent our, our very worst inclinations and they have the ability to spread, to uh, invite copycat instances of violence and often involve mass efforts at, at uh, extracting violence against particular communities. So it is something that we are deeply concerned about. We've talked about some of the historical instances and events that are known to many of us, but there are many also that fall under the radar and your reference to the threats of the schools in your districts are a great example of ones that we don't hear about every day in the news, but still wreak the havoc that we've been discussing in terms of the terror that they produce in individuals and in whole communities.